Welcome to Coastal Matters. This is a new monthly show here on Channel 18, sponsored by the Nantucket Coastal Conservancy. And since it is the first show, I thought it would be appropriate if we had the president of the Coastal Conservancy as the first guest. Deanne Atherin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Charlie. I'm pleased to be here. What is the mission of the Nantucket Coastal Conservancy? The mission of the Nantucket Coastal Conservancy is to protect and preserve our island's coastal resources through education, research, and advocacy to ensure that future generations have the opportunity to use and enjoy them. It's a long mission. Simply put, it's all about the beaches. Well, and print is much shorter than it is <laughs> right, right. orally. It's long to say. Uh, full disclosure, I'm also on the board of the National Coastal yes, Coastal Conservancy. you are. Give us a history of the group. Well, it's interesting, Charlie. We, um, there were a group of citizens who came together in 2008 who were concerned at the time because there was a proposal before the Conservation Commission for a really massive beach dredging project in Sconset. And um, we came together and called ourselves the Coalition for Responsible Coastal Management and carefully monitored the conservation commissions. And the more we learned about the project, the more concerned we became. And we, at that time, mobilized and um, a political action. We had a, a referendum vote to vote no and also to ask the citizens if they wanted to form a coastal management plan. And we were successful on both counts. So the proponents of the beach nourishment project withdrew their proposal and the town moved forward with the development of a coastal management plan. So that's really the first a number of us really became aware of issues relating to erosion and erosion control. And who were some of the people involved? Well, at that time it was many of the same people as now. It's a diverse grassroots group of, of citizens, Charlie, of year-round and seasonal residents, young and old, um, fishermen, environmentalists, surfers, people who just love our beaches. And um, many of the same people who were involved then are involved now. Well, one of them is Peter Brace, who has been yes. a journalist on the island for, for decades and uh, is the author of the book, Nantucket, A Natural History. Yes. And he's written a lot of articles all about a number of things, but in particular about the Conservation Commission hearings, which, which he's been attending on a regular basis. Yes. Um, when we... Um, when we reorganized and reconstituted ourselves as a nonprofit organization with a new name, the Nantucket Coastal Conservancy, and a mission, um, we, we, we engaged Peter to help us with writing because we felt it was very important to try and educate the community at large about the issues that we were seeing. Namely, that with climate change and rising sea level would come issues of erosion and erosion control, which in some instances could put Nantucket's natural beaches at risk. And we couldn't think of anyone better to um, attend the Conservation Commission meetings and to report on them than Peter. And actually, our whole effort is all comprised of volunteers. We all do what we do for the Nantucket Coastal Conservancy as volunteers. Peter is the one person that we provide a very modest stipend for, and we're, we're happy to do so. We also employ, or not employ, but we also uh, use uh, photographs by a number of, of we local do. photographers. We do, and again, we just were so grateful for people's volunteer contributions to what we're doing. Um, we have really three, three photographers. One is Susan Landman, who lives in Quidnet, who just treks all over the island and has literally taken hundreds of photos. 
Greg Hinson has already taken photos, but really has done a number of um, videos for us with his drone video camera. And then, of course, Peter also takes pictures. Many of Susan's photos and Greg's videos are available on our website. And, and our website is www.savenantucketbeaches.org. And they show up on Facebook posts as well. They do. We, we have a very active Facebook page. We post almost daily. And um, often with uh, information about erosion and erosion control on Nantucket, regionally on the state level, and really nationally. So people send us links of interest, and um, we try and keep up on whatever is happening, and that would interest people. And we're, we have quite a number of followers on Facebook, and it just seems to be growing and growing. We also tweet on occasion. <laughs> Erosion Happens is our tw Twitter handle. When you talk about Nantucket's shoreline, erosion is maybe the first thing that comes to mind yeah. for many reasons. But it's, it's not as simple as that. There's also a question of the, the wildlife that uh, you can find either you know, in the sea or in the harbor or along the beach. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not just a matter of erosion by any means. It's not, Charlie. It's a whole, it's a whole coastal environment with many resources. Um, I think sort of as I learn more about it and as I understand the science is that the coastal processes that make Nantucket Nantucket that have shaped our shoreline for forever are all, all interrelated. So if, if, if some part of the process is interrupted, it has impacts throughout the system. I think to me that's the most important concept to, to grasp. And to put it in other words, if, if something, if there is a barrier of, of any kind, natural or unnatural, if there's a barrier on a stretch of coastline, um, that can cause increased erosion on either side of that barrier. Correct. So if you're protecting a piece of property, you might be damaging your neighbor's property in the process. Correct. And erosion has been, as you say, erosion has been going on for, for millennia, but now the island, with erosion and with rising sea level, you're getting a smaller island. And a lot of this, what we're dealing with and, and looking into is because not just erosion, but rising sea level as well. They're intertwined. Exactly. And increasing and stronger storm events that are happening. Um, as, we're, as we're understanding this more and as we educate ourselves and talk to the scientists, the experts in the field, we're learning that erosion really is that process that makes Nantucket Nantucket. Without erosion, we wouldn't have beaches. And that um, the problem as um, Corey Dean, who has been one of our speakers at our forum, said, isn't with erosion. The problem is when there are man-made structures that are built too close to an eroding shoreline. That's when the problem arises. So the question we're all dealing with is, is how do we respond to that? And how do we do it in a way that strikes a balance between our environmental concerns and the interest of the property owner or the owner of that structure. Simply put, I think that that's a challenge that we're facing now and it's going to become, you know, increasingly prevalent with, with climate change and rising sea level. A lot of our attention has been on the Sconset Bluff Project, but just to give another example of the kind of thing we have been looking at and will be looking at, when they start to construct a new jetty, which I think is scheduled mm -hmm. for September of 2015, mm -hmm. um, that's going to increase the speed of the flow of water into the harbor mm -hmm. during the tides. What is that going to do? Well, 
I guess we'll find out when it happens. We'll but, find out. But that's the sort of thing we're also looking at. It, it's, this is, is not just an erosion group. This is any aspect of the shoreline uh, that, that should be looked at is something we want to look at. Exactly. Again, keeping in mind our mission, which is to preserve and protect our coastal resources. I think that's the reason many of us come to Nantucket, uh, not only those of us who live here, but people who come to visit come for our shoreline and our beautiful, um, unique coastal environment. And we just want to do everything we can to keep it that way. And people have access to almost all the beaches, whether it's because they're owned by a conservation group or because private owners allow people to go on there. And it's not like that in a lot of other places. I mean, Martha's Vineyard is not like that at all. That's a right. lot of private beaches are, are blocked off. and. You know, Malibu, California is another place that gets a lot of headlines because you can't just walk down the beach. There'll be a fence or a gate or somebody to, mm -hmm. to tell you to get lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that here. So it's especially important that we keep an eye on our beaches and make sure they're in the best condition possible. And that's, that's an ongoing challenge. I also sit on the roads and right of way committee of the town and county, and our really core mission is public access to the water. Now, what will happen, what, what has happened, and it's happened on, um, I would say, the North Shore in the Eel Point area, where there are property owners who are, who are doing erosion control installations, again, because it impacts adjacent property. If the adjacent property is a public access point, Mm -hmm. that the town has spent a lot of time and energy negotiating for and maintaining, we have to be vigilant that, that that installation in front of the private property doesn't scour away the public access that we have finally managed to put in place. So that's something that we're looking at. There's another, there's another spot in Shimo. For instance, we don't... We're concerned we don't have enough access points um, on the harbor from um, from the harbor going east to Wawinet. So all the few that we do have, we try and watch very carefully. And there is one that is being refurbished and revegetated with a grant from the Coastal Zone Management um, at the state level that Dave Franzuto was able to get. There actually, there are three projects that are going on. One is at a public access point in, I believe it's in Shimo. Another one is at the end of Madiket Road where there's been mm -hmm. so much erosion yes. and we're trying to um, revegetate that area and direct p pedestrian access to the beach sort of over a certain path so people aren't going over the dunes and not a exacerbating erosion. And then I th the third one perhaps is at the end of Hummock Pond Road. I'm not sure we'll have to check with Dave. Well, that's another spot that's seen erosion, well, for as long as I've been coming here, and that's, yeah. that's over 50 years. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about some of the, um, the programs we have sponsored or co-sponsored. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a film called Shored Up, which deals mm -hmm. with coastal erosion mm -hmm. um, all up and down the East Coast, actually. Mm -hmm. And we brought that to the island and had a private showing of that, or not a private showing, but it was at the Great Hall of the Athenaeum. It was. It was an award-winning documentary that, um, while it did, it did focus on the whole East Coast, it really primarily was targeted to New Jersey and the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. And we were able to see there um, extensive beach nourishment projects and what happens again with increased and severe storm events, climate change, rising sea levels in coastal communities where the structures are built so close to the shoreline and how people have dealt with that. So we were extremely pleased with the screening of Shored Up. We had um, you know, a record attendance, and we had a good discussion afterwards. 
And you grew up in New Jersey and spent a lot of time on the Jersey Shore. I so did. So this was particularly <laughs> meaningful to you. It was. In fact, I one of the reasons we're here is because Nantucket is not New Jersey. <laughs> and our beaches are not the Jersey beaches. I always thought, Charlie, growing up, you know, going to the shore meant a beach badge and boardwalks and Ferris wheels and parking meters. And I think when our family came here and... We just could not believe the beautiful, pristine beaches and how accessible they were to everyone. I think that's made Nantucket so special to, to us as it has to many people. And um, we're, I think there is a realization that that doesn't come without um, us paying attention to it. Yeah, just because it's here today, it may not be here in exactly. 10 years in exactly. the same way. Exactly. And we also sponsored for the last two years a mm -hmm. coastal erosion forum. Mm -hmm. We did. We had um, we've had two forums on beach erosion, both in the spring of last year and this year, where we bring. Actually, the first year we brought just one expert. This year we expanded it, and we had two sessions. Um, and looked the first session we looked at the big picture of um, climate change and adaptation to rising sea level. And then on um, the second session, we had experts where we looked more specifically at strategies for adaptation, both on the state level and on Nantucket. And thanks to Channel 18, both of those forums were videotaped and um, have been broadcast extensively during the summer and also are available for anyone who's interested um, online on demand. You mentioned the Coastal Management Plan back at the mm -hmm. top of the show, mm -hmm. and as you say, there is one in place, but it only covers town-owned land. So yes. in other words, it does not cover most of the island. Exactly, Charlie. We were, we were disappointed in that. Uh, when town meeting acted and, um, and endorsed the concept of the development of a coastal management plan, the expectation was that it would be island-wide. Unfortunately, um, the selectmen decided to narrow uh, the charge to the coastal management plan work group to uh, deal with only town-owned land. It was, th the work group was excellent. They met for over a year. The plan is very good as far as it goes. I think those of us who understand really see it as just the first part and that the second part should be a comprehensive plan for the entire island. As Rob Young, Dr. Robert Young, who heads the program for the study of developed shorelines, which is a joint venture with Duke University and um, Western Carolina University. And who's appearing on a future edition of Coastal Matters. Oh, that's right. As Rob says, you can't do coastal management parcel by parcel no. or, you know, community by community. We're, we're fortunate in a way that we're an island. We have one coastline that, you know, we, we all care about. And um, we are just hopeful that the next step will be a comprehensive coastal management plan, such as we originally envisioned. I jokingly say that to deal with coastal management only on town-owned land is like saying we'll deal with mosquito control only on town-owned land. It's virtually impossible. That's a good we analogy. can't keep the mosquitoes only on town-owned land. They're going to go on to private property. And it's the same thing with coastal management. Well, it's a good start, but it, it, it definitely needs more work. It does. It does. It that's does. something we'll be looking at. I think uh, that's something that, that um, our coordinating group will look at. We'll have our an annual strategy session in September where we set our priorities for the year and part of our action plans for advocacy would be to advocate with the powers that be of the town to move forward with the next step in developing a coastal management plan. Another thing we're aware of is um, a study that was put together by a group of students from Worcester Polytech Institute. And they were here 
sometime in the last, last year. I don't remember. Last fall. Last fall. Last fall, I think. So that would have been 2014. The, yes. The fall of 2014. And they um, they did an inventory of working with the Conservation Commission or the Natural Resource Department. Um, they did an inventory of all the erosion control projects of any kind anywhere in the island, um, which meant you know walking down beaches when it's 20 degrees out or whatever and, and the wind is blowing. Um, but that's been an invaluable resource for everybody. It has, and anyone can access that. There is an interactive, those students did a wonderful job. And they, they developed an interactive map, which is available on our website. And um, interested citizens can go and click on, you know, all of the erosion control structures that are in the database are identified on the interactive map. And um, you just cl click on each one can't remember how many there are. Maybe there are 40, as much as 40, all around the island. There are more than people would think. There, there are more. It surprised more. me how many there were. Yeah, and the students divided the island into four sections. So there's the um, south shore, what they call the northwest section, which is west of the jetties. Um, the harbor, which would go from the harbor to Walwinet, and then east and down to Sconset. And... Uh, uh, interested people can go to each section, click on, click on the map, and it will bring up photographs yeah. of the structure that's in place. And it's very informative, very interesting. And, and we encourage to everyone. Use. It really is. Again, it's already, I mean, we're, our challenge is going to be to keep it up to date mm -hmm. because the students completed their project and made their presentations, I believe, in early December. And um, we do know that there have been changes made since then. So that's something that I think that the NCC, we call it the Nantucket Coastal Conservancy, we call ourselves NCC. NCC will have to look a bit at about how we might keep that updated. One possibility is to work with the students from the environmental science class, the AP environmental science class at the high school, um, and get them to to uh, to keep that database current. Yeah, they were looking at the projects and they were also looking at uh, what state the project was in. Yes. And they were also looking at only those approved projects. They were. That, that were on record of the, the Conservation were. Commission they office. Were. And this probably sounds familiar to a lot of people because they did make a presentation to the Board of Selectmen at a public meeting. They uh, did, and that uh, might be available fall. online too. Um, mm -hmm. And they not only, another aspect they tried, they tried to assess how effective each installation was. Mm -hmm. And they admittedly said there were no, they, they, they established some basic criteria and did sort of a rudimentary assessment. Um, so that's a step in the right direction too. It, it is, and it's a moving target because what isn't working today might work in six months and vice versa. What has worked for the last three years might not work at all for the next two years. So yes. it, it's something that requires constant monitoring. It does. And another another um, helpful part of that interactive map is they differentiated between um, structures that are called hard structures and soft structures. So hard erosion control structures are usually seawalls, seawalls of rock or steel or wood or geotextile tubes. And that's really um, a method of trying to just hold the sea at bay. Soft structures um, are, are installations that attempt to work with Mother Nature and not against her. And so stru soft structures around the island are really fabric-filled um, I mean, uh, sand-filled fabric bags, yeah. and they're usually anchored in some way, or they sit behind the modern equivalent of snow fencing, what we think of snow fencing from our youth, yeah. um, which is somewhat like, I can remember when we first came to Nantucket about the Christmas trees, about yes. where we would put Christmas trees in mm -hmm. the dunes. And the idea is to try and 
trap some of the sand that just naturally moves back and forth to, to kind of to hopefully build up the dunes and pro yes. provide some protection. So using those definitions, the WPI students um, differentiated each one, and when when people go to the interactive map, they'll see one's designated with red and one with blue. And there's a big difference between the two in terms of their impacts. Well, I mentioned a few minutes ago that Dr. Rob Young, who was at the Coastal Erosion Forum, uh, will appear on a future show. Um, also, Cornelia Dean will appear on a future show. She mm -hmm. was the former, is the former science editor of the New York Times. Mm -hmm as well as a, a resident of Martha's Vineyard. Mm -hmm. Chappaquiddick, matter of fact. Chappaquiddick. Deanne Atherton, thanks very much for joining me today. Charlie, thank you, and best of luck with Coastal Matters. Thank you. For Coastal Matters, I'm Charlie Walters here on Channel 18. Thanks for joining us, and tune in again next time.